Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, and verse 4, it says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, and verse 21, the B clause, says, Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. I'm reading for the, from the King James Version. That's why you hear the ye is and all that. I like it. Amen. Um, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Luke says, Blessed are ye that weep now, for you shall laugh. I want to preach today from this subject, mourning and laughing. Mourning and laughing. Father, bless us now as we minister the word of the Lord. May we preach the word today, God, with power and authority. And we ask you, O oh God, to save the soul that's nearest hell today. Strengthen us, Father. We're nothing without you. Can't live without you. We can't survive without you. We can't make it. You're our keeper, you're our God, you're our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning and laughing. Amen. Um, and, and we learned that uh, last time, uh, Thursday night, uh, that this word morning describes, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the Greek language, it is the strongest uh, use, the penthos, the strongest use uh, form of mourning. It's like mourning the death of a loved one, mourning the sudden death of a friend, mourning the death uh, of a child, mourning, 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 um, deep mourning. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's dealing with our mourning over uh, Elder Northington, God bless the Northingtons, mourning over our sin. When was the last time you met someone or talked to someone who were just mournful, just disgusted with themselves because of their, their sin? We, we tend to meet people often who are disgusted with others but mourning because we've failed God. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Since today is uh, Pentecost, Brother Chase, the word comforted is closely related to the Greek word from which we get the word comforter. And the comforter is our, our paracletes, the Holy Ghost, who is our Comfort us. So Jesus says, if you mourn, you will be comforted. Luke says, those who are weeping now shall laugh. So uh, in the message Thursday night, the blessings of tears, we learned that the presence of tears doesn't necessarily mean the absence of joy. Just as the presence of laughter doesn't necessarily mean the presence of joy. Everybody who's laughing isn't happy. And just as everybody who's crying aren't uh, uh, unhappy. We also learn that joy, as the world understands it, has its source, worldly joy now, worldly happiness, has its source um, in the outside world, sinners are happy and, I guess, carnal Christians are happy as long as things are going the way that they want them to go. We're happy. Um, just won a Grammy. We're happy. Just won the Super Bowl. Happy. Got the job you wanted. We're happy because the circumstances were favorable to what we want. That's, that's the world's understanding 
of happy. It has its source. It comes as a result of things that happen on the outside instead of springing up from within the heart and the soul of a man. See, the joy of the believers, God wants us to grow to where our joy it doesn't come from what happens on the outside, in the outside world, but our joy exists as a result of something that Christ has done on the inside of us. See, when Christ has worked his work on the inside, you'll have joy on the outside. Uh, it will show no matter what. Because, see, nobody's life is a string of pleasant experiences. Amen. We all go through tough times. Praise the Lord. Nobody, nobody, you know, somebody said when we get to heaven, uh, you know, sister, I, I was looking for you. I want you to sing for me. I, I, yeah. Uh, she's a great singer. Praise the Lord. We, we got to line that up. Amen. You said when we get to heaven, it says every day uh, is going to be Sunday. I'm glad that's not true. Because some of my worst days, are Sundays. When we get to heaven, every day will be heavenly. As a matter of fact, heaven will be one day. There will be no night there. That's something, isn't it? Praise the Lord. But down here, you know, there's a time to laugh, there's a time to mourn, time to weep, time to cry. It's the different times. So in, in, in the believer, uh, our joy comes from something or it should, that happens from within. We also learn that Jesus will give us joy even when life's circumstances are not laughter-producing. Believers go through funerals different than non-believers. They call uh, evangelist Pickett up to do the prayer at her father's homegoing celebration yesterday. You would have thought that Sister Pickett thought that she was at the Holy Convocation, the way she prayed, then finished praying and turned sideways and danced up a storm with her father's remains right there. And her brother, Freeman Pickett, did the eulogy. Two months ago, when their mother passed away, uh, the brother, Pastor Pickett, did the eulogy for their mother. What gave them the strength to do such a thing, it was not the setting from without. For the setting was not one conducive to joy. Your mother's remains, your father's remains, in a casket. That's your, that's your, that's your mom, your dad. That, uh, that has to be something on the inside. <laughs> Glory to God. That gives you power to stand in a situation like that and deliver a eulogy or pray the prayer and then to, uh, to get up and cut a step in the name of the Lord. The Lord pays attention to how we respond when life is laughter producing, but he pays more attention to how we respond toward him when life is not laughter producing. He wants to know, is he worthy of a praise when, when the circumstances aren't praise producing? He wants to know, is he worthy of a, of a hand check, a wave? Is, is there a hallelujah? When things aren't going their way, the late Thomas Whitfield was on his way to the studio, the story goes, to, uh, to, to uh, record a song. And he had nothing. He had nothing. He says, he says yeah, I have nothing. Just nothing. You know, there are times when it just doesn't flow. He says, I have nothing. And so at the stoplight, he has nothing. And he said, well, <sighs> Hallelujah, anyhow. And there you have it. His biggest hit. Hallelujah, anyhow. Isn't that something? Sometimes in God, it's the simplest thing 
that gives you power to move forward. The key to our text, you know, the key to this joy that we're talking about, it's a paradox. The key to it is to be mournful. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are ye that weep now, for you shall laugh. God gives us true laughter. Amen. There, there, there's, a, there, there's some things that the Lord wants us to project. In the book, The Pursuit of Happiness, a story is told um, of a poor, um, wretched man. A very, what was a wretched? He wasn't wretched. He was weak. He was tired. He was a wreck of a man. He was just tired. And the man went to see a famous London doctor. And the doctor said to the man who went to see him, the doctor said, you need to laugh. And so the doctor wrote him a, a prescription. He says, go down uh, to see, to hear uh, Garibaldi. Garibaldi was a comedian. He said, you need to go and hear him. He's a, not a comedian. He's a famous clown. Go see this famous clown. He says, all London is out and they're going to see him and he has all London in stitches. And the old man straightened himself and looked at the doctor and says, doctor, I am Garamaldi. See, laughing when it comes at the comic strips is not real fun. He had them laughing but often, oftentimes, those who are tasked with making us laugh are miserable themselves. The comedian Robin Williams killed himself. Most of these people aren't happy people away from the stage. You don't hear what I'm saying. See, we have to be careful that we allow the God of the Bible to give us true laughter. Because he makes us laugh. Amen. He, he gives us joy. Uh, uh, from that same book, there's a, a story of a, of a deacon. And I'll preach in just a minute. But this deacon uh, was scrutinizing the people who were getting off of a train because he had the task of picking up the visiting minister. A visiting minister whom he had never met. So he's watching the people as they, get, they alight off the train. And so he walks up to one man and says to him, are you the minister? The man answered in a very curt way and said, no. My indigestion makes me look this way. Many believers look like they have indigestion all the time. <laughs> We've given the world the wrong impression. Amen. We've given the world the wrong impression of what it means to be a Christian, and to know Jesus Christ. Are we the people of God? Is it the will of God that we are devoid of laughter? I notice even here, the sheer number of people who have what appears to be permanent scars on your faces. Whether you're in the audience, on the choir, in the pulpit, Oftentimes, we have to talk to you about looking a certain way. Hey, you're in the camera. Hey, you're up singing. Hey, you're sitting in the audience. Hey, hey, hey. Make sure. Check your expressions. Make sure. Why this? They never told us these things back in the day. What has happened? Where is the joy? Why is it that you have to be told to look happy? If you have the joy of the Lord. 
Give me, a, give me a chance. Give me a chance. Give me a chance. Uh, uh, you should never, as a believer, have to be told that twice. It's not a compliment to you to have to be uh, told this on a regular basis. Because what it means is you're not letting the love of Christ shine through. Amen. And, and people need to see Jesus in us. They, they, need, they, need to, they need to be able to notice that there's something about you different when you're standing in line to buy coffee. Amen. At the coffee shop. You, there's, well, what, what is it about that person? They may not know what it is, but they ought to know, know that it's something. Other than the expression that says, I hadn't had my coffee yet. Well, good morning. What's so good about it? I, I, I got a saint one day. I walked up to us. Ma'am, how you doing? We, we were at a national meeting. Fine. Uh, the Lord is, are you blessed today and all that? Well, I'm all right. But blah, blah, blah. So I finally told her, I said, ma'am, I'm talking to you. Uh, I'm kind of I'm waiting for you to, to just be nice. And let me tell you what happened. See, what I had on this judge, she couldn't see the chain. Messed around here. And when she saw she was talking to a bitch, oh, bitch. Oh, bitch. Do you have to be a bishop for somebody to be polite? Is that? Is that is that is that is that the, is that where Christianity has dropped to? Do you have to be somebody other than a human being for us to be nice to? Perhaps our joyless faces and lack of willingness to smile come from a a basic misunderstanding of what Christ is saying in our text. Perhaps it comes from preachers and teachers who fail to preach and teach the word of God in context. Contextual setting is everything to understanding the scripture. Otherwise, the meaning of things are just in the air and left to uh, private interpretations. Have you ever tried to have... Conversation with people who do not talk in context. Context is everything. Everything. Um, uh, look, look at this um, a particular passage of, of, of our text. Our text in Luke's gospel, chapter 6, uh, verse 21b uh, down, it says, Blessed are ye uh, that weep now, for you shall laugh. And it says, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall uh, uh, separate you from their company and, and shall reproach you and shall cast your name out as evil for the son of man's sake. He says, rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the, the like manner did they, uh, did their fathers unto the prophets but it says, but woe unto you that are rich, uh, for you have received your consolation. Now look at this. Woe unto you that are full, for ye, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto them that, here's what I want to get to, laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Uh, so maybe uh, um, lifted out of its context, we perhaps feel that Jesus was saying that saints aren't to laugh now. But when you look at the context, when you study Luke uh, verse 21 through 26 and Matthew's gospel chapter three verse chapter five, verse three through 12, the Beatitudes in both cases, you will see in Luke's gospel chapter six, verse 21, verse 22, you'll see the phrase, "For the Son of Man's sake." In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 11, you see, for my sake. That's the contextual setting. Jesus says, if for my sake uh, you, 
you have to mourn, you're going to be comforted. If for my sake, you're not weeping, you're weeping right now, I'll make you laugh. If the rule is not don't laugh or no, don't be comforted. The point is sometimes in standing for Jesus, if you have to choose between laughter and the acceptance of the world and the world loving you at the expense of Christ, choose to do without the laughter. Choose to have to, to go through. Choose to not have the applause of the world for Christ's sake. And Christ says, if you do this for me, I'll make you laugh. When you choose the world and the world's acclaim and the world's acceptance at the expense of Christ, oh, you're going to cry later and you're going to be tormented and you'll end up being lost. I say to all who have sold your souls to the devil and you can, you can, there's a lot of conversations about things like that online about various stars, various performers, whether some gospel, some secular who have sold out for fame and fortune. I just want to say this. You've gotten the short end of the stick. Listen, you, you made the worst deal you could ever make because life here is too short. Whatever Satan promises you, whatever Satan promises you here, even if the devil delivered on all that he promised, you are still not going to be here but for so long. You will be there in eternity forever. And if you're crazy enough to sell your soul for a mansion that you might live in for 60 or 70 years and a Rolls Royce and, and the acclaim of the world, if you think that's worth spending eternity in hell over, that's something wrong with you. See, because eternity, eternity never ends. You'll be crying long after you forgot about the Grammys and the Stellas, the Grammys and all of the awards and the Oscars and all the world who, who sung my praises. You should have seen the all the magazine covers I made. That stuff will mean nothing if you end up in hell. The key is... For my sake. Praise the Lord. Otherwise, if we, didn't, if we don't understand that it's for his sake, we, might, we may assume that saints or that believers aren't supposed to be joyful people. And, and people who have laughter. True mourning over one's sin and the sins of others. It's a paradox. It produces Laughter, it produces joy. The presence of Christ produces tears. Tears of joy, as well as tears of conviction. The presence of Christ often produces laughter as well. I laugh when I think of how Jesus brought me out. Yeah, I, I, I burst out into laughter when I think that the devil thought he had me, but I got away. Good God on my, just that thought ought to put a smile on your face. That when the enemy had already assumed that you would be lost in hell. And when you see how the Lord delivered you, you laugh. When you, you laugh, you ought to laugh when you think that you had cancer in your body and the devil said you were down for the count and Satan says she's not going to live or he's not going to live but God stepped in. Now here you are at church. Y'all, That ought to put a laughter uh, that ought to cause joy to explode from within. It's been good to me been good to me that should move you to uh, display praise the Lord God's goodness amen David's mind was blown when he, cons- con- he when he simply considered 
the sheer magnitude of the created universe. Psalms chapter 8, David said, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. That's written with an exclamation point there. Oh Lord. Sound like a holiness preacher. Oh Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens. Then he goes, he goes from way up there, atmosphere, stratosphere, ionosphere, all those spheres up there. He goes way, he, he leaves there and goes all, he comes all the way down, all the way down, all the way down to the earth and says, when I consider the heavens, when I consider thy heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained. When I just look up, when I just look up, tonight go outside and just look up. You ought to get happy when you look up. But when you look up, you got to think now. You got to think, you got to have, you got to, you know, you got to think, you got to realize just a little bit of what it is that you're looking at. The sheer greatness of it. This is why I look at all these things. He says, I come all the way down and says, what is man? Verse 4, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? When I see the greatness of your created universe, I burst out into a doxology. I go into a praise. Joy takes over. Laughter comes from within. When I realize how great the God of the Bible is. Now, let me preach to you one thing about Jesus, one thing about our Savior now. Our Savior knew how to enjoy himself. Now, Jesus died on the cross, but that ain't all he did. Jesus, our Lord, was, uh, praise Lord, he knew how to be social. He wasn't the one that you had to walk up to and say, are you all right? Well, why are you asking me that? Well, you look like you're miserable. Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. You're not going to get a wife that way. You're not going to get a husband that way. You're not going to get a job that way. Praise the Lord. Anybody going to hire you? And go to a job interview. You sit there looking mad like the, you're not going to get the job. <laughs> I mean, you sit there looking like what? Oh, no, I tell you what, you go on with your unemployed self. You're not going to get a job that way. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm, I'm telling you something. Oh, no, 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 no. As a matter of fact, our Lord, I don't, I don't want to, our Lord mastered being social so uh, that they lied on him. See, you would think that if you went to, first of all, you'd be surprised to find out that Jesus, even though it's written all in the Bible, Jesus went to feasts and to celebrations. Matter of fact, he started his ministry. First miracle was at a wedding. A feast after a wedding. Bible teaches that a feast is for laughter. So we find Jesus at a feast in Cana of Galilee. He shows up, uh, at, and, and matter of fact, you know he had to be a cool fella because he was invited. The marriage party, we want you to come. Jesus showed up, he and the disciples. His mama was there, he was there, here, here comes Jesus at the party. And he wasn't standing over in the corner looking like he had indigestion either. So Jesus is there, Praise the Lord at the party. Oh, I'm preaching good. And uh, I, I know some of you just saying to yourself, no, I'm going to look miserable. I don't care what you say. You know what? You know what my position on that is? God may freeze your face just like that. And if he does, don't ask me to pray. I ain't praying. I'm not praying. I'm not praying that God take it up because no, you want to look like that. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Fix it, Jesus. Do it for him right now. <laughs> See, 
feast. So Jesus goes to the marriage feast of Cana, and guess what happens? Guess what happens? They run out of wine. Now, Pastor, what, what, do, you, what do you do with that? Nothing. They ran out of wine. That's what the Bible said. The Bible said they ran out of wine. Now, I will say that the wine in biblical times, oh, I don't want anybody to, to joyfully run out of here and go to the ABC store either. <laughs> oh, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. The wine, the wine, uh, it, it, would take, uh, it would take at least 12 shots, one man said, of, of, uh, of, uh, of wine in biblical times that equal the alcohol content of one of uh, 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 shots that we, that y'all, they, <laughs> I, had to, I had to get away from we fast, you know. <laughs> that, was, that was a slip. I don't, I don't drink. I, I tried that one time. I didn't like the taste of it. Amen. I did like strong drink, but the Lord delivered me. You'll know, you'll know if I've actually, you, you would know, I couldn't hide it. I'd show up with a beer gut. I'd have to preach down in this far from the mic. <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed the taste of beer. Thank God he delivered me. I saw someone the other day with one of them things hanging out. I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've done. So, so let me preach this now. So they run out. And they, they, Mary puts her son on the spot. She says, listen, uh, um, uh, uh, he can help. He looks at his mom and said, Mom, my time hasn't yet come. It, it, ain't, it ain't time. We're at a party. She looks away from him and says, Hey, whatever my son tells you to do, do it. Jesus says, All right. Fill the water pots. Uh, he asked them, verse 7. And Jesus says, He said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them with water, filled it to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw. Out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. So they went and got the wine, got the water. And when the governor, when the ruler of the feast had tasted. Oh my. Somebody's getting happy. The water that was made wine. And knew not whence it was. He didn't know where it came from. And by the way, my official rule is this. If Jesus makes wine for you out of water, drink it. I didn't say Jack Daniels. I said Jesus. If it's Jesus, drink it. If it's not Jesus, pray on my child. Stay saved and stay holy. Amen. The man drunk it. He didn't know why it came from. It came from Jesus. Jesus made wine. Hallelujah. And, uh, but his servants knew and uh, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Jesus blessed the man and said, you know, every man at the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the, of the thing, he sets forth the good wine and, and he, leaves, he leaves the bad wine for after, you know, folk have, 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 have uh, drunk the wine and they've gotten dr they're good and high and they can't tell, you know, they can't tell the taste anymore because they are inebriated, you know. And uh, he says, but, but you saved the good wine for last. And the Bible says, this the, begin, the, this, the beginning of miracles, did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. His first miracle was turning water into wine. It wasn't healing the sick. It wasn't raising the dead. It was helping the crowd get a little, just a little more tipsy. Isn't that something? And not only that, not only that, but you know, when Jesus went to, I'm going to preach in just a minute, when he went to the feasts, according to Matthew's writings, 
chapter 11, verse 19, according to Luke's writings, chapter 7, verse 34, when Jesus went to feast, he was accused, that was false, but he was accused of being a gluttonous person and accused of being a wine bibber. Now, in other words, they were saying, when he goes to the party, he eat too much. Gluttonous. Eat too much. Gluttony. Eat too much. So when Jesus went to the gatherings, he didn't, he didn't stand back. I ain't going to touch it. I'm not, uh-uh, no, I'm not eating. I'm not going to touch I'm not eating a thing. Jesus said, move, man. Give me, give me a piece of this. And I have some of that. And I, who baked that cake over? Give me some of this. Praise the Lord. And people standing talking to him. He's standing talking and eating and smiling and folk enjoying it. You know, people loved him now. When you read the Bible, you see what crowds followed him. Listen, ain't nobody going to follow nobody with a scar on their face. Right, you look like you look like you've just eaten a lemon. Nobody's following anybody who looks like that. Life is hard enough already. Praise the Lord. We're looking for some joy. And so here's Jesus standing there. And, and you know, the Lord was a carpenter's son. And carpenters were more like lumberjacks in biblical days. And as, boy, as, a, as the boy he grew up moving those big logs, working with his daddy. So he's strong there. He's standing there. He's eating his cake, enjoying the feast. They called him a gluttonous man. And you know what they call, what else they call him, Williams? They called him a wine bibber. A wine bibber is one, I said it was falsely accused, uh, is one who drinks too much wine. So they said, man, you, he, he goes to the party, he eats too much, and he drinks too much wine. Nobody would call a killjoy a wine bibber. Nobody would call a party pooper a gluttonous person. Nobody would have accused him of those things if he kept a permanent scar on his face. The point is, he knew how to enjoy himself and to ingratiate himself in every setting. We could use a little more of this. Oh, it's quiet in here. But you know, Titus tells told even the slaves to adorn the doctrine. Bible teaches, because the saints, we want to be attractive. Bible teaches in uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 10 says, not prolonging, that is, as saints, we shouldn't be embezzlers, but showing good, uh, showing good, all good fidelity that they may, look at this, adorn the doctrine. The word adorn, the, the doctrine of God. Adorn means to beautify. To adorn means to make attractive. Praise the Lord. Believers ought to beautify the doctrine. Believers ought to be whimsical people. One of the things that we, we mastered, we mastered in the church. I wish I could get a praying church. We mastered one-liners. We've mastered put-downs. We've mastered knowing how to insult. We've, we've mastered knowing how to make fun of people. We've mastered, we've mastered knowing how to laugh at people. Not necessarily to laugh. And, and in God, true laughter is not laughter that is always at the expense of someone else. This is why I, I, dis, I, I despise, and I'll preach about it in just a minute, the, the, the ministry of the so-called Christian comedian because that ministry is not a ministry. It, it doesn't produce true laughter. Are you with me? They would never have called Jesus a kill, uh, uh, would, would have called, uh, would have accused Jesus of being a wine bibber if he was a killjoy. If he didn't bring joy. They wouldn't have called him gluttonous if he didn't bring joy. The Bible says in Proverbs 17 and 22, a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Saints, let me tell you something. Fight this depression. Fight this tendency to always be sad. Fight this thing. It will, it is pathological. It will make you sick. Sick. 
Many of us die with conditions that have been brought on that came straight from our frame of mind. Hallelujah. Let the Lord anoint your heart to make you merry. A merry heart will heal you. A merry heart is an attractive heart. Mm. Oh, my. The issue is not whether or not the saints should laugh. The issue is not whether or not the God of the Bible will comfort us. Now, a question may be, uh, is uh, the question that we might ask is, what are we laughing at? What is the cause of the laughter? What is the object of our laughter? What is the motive of our laughter? One man said, much more educated than I am, said only fools laugh for the sake of laughing. I agree with that. Laughing, laughter has to be placed properly. You don't laugh at things that are not funny. You don't laugh at the expense of others. And you don't laugh I'm not going to say something that's going to get you. You don't laugh just because a thing tickles you. Believers are called to exercise intelligent laughter because our laughter uh, is simply, is also to glorify God. I can't get a witness. You're a preacher, I don't understand that. Well, you, well, you know, you're not, you, you, just as, you know, you, you said you don't laugh just because you're tickled. Well, you know, you shouldn't eat just because food is present. Some of us do, but you're not supposed to. You're supposed to eat when you're hungry. You don't have sex with a person just because you find them sexually attractive. There's a word for that. It's called fornication. fornication. Adultery. Adultery. Am I right about that? Right. No, no, no. The believer has to be disciplined. Mm. Oh my. There is, there, is, there is something to what God has called us to. And see, we, we, we're to never laugh to shame God. The Bible teaches in Ephesians, it's clear on this, Ephesians 5 and 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. And this word here, jesting, literally means obscene joking. Blue jokes. The kind Steve Harvey, Chris Rock. I mean, look at, look at the condition of the body of Christ now. We even got jokers. The people invite them to their churches. The man come in and tell jokes dressed in drag. And you let somebody, a guy, come into your church dressed like a woman telling jokes. I wouldn't preach in a church. If you're going to allow something like that, don't invite me because that's wrong. One thing you got to give Tyler, credit, uh, Tyler Perry credit for, he figured out a way to get black folk to accept drag. RuPaul couldn't get us to accept drag, but, but old Tyler figured it out. Look at how you won't say amen now. Tyler figured it out through Madea. The Madea character calls us to accept drag. Now, let me ask you a question. You mean to tell me that Tyler Perry had a problem finding an overweight sister to play Madea? All he had to do is spin the box. Praise God. You don't like what I'm saying? The point... Well, my, my, my point is not my point is not weight. My point is what he was doing. He found a way. He used laughter to bring drag into our conscience, into our homes, and into our churches, and we love it so so much so that you won't even say amen. And I'm telling you the truth. In the name of jokes. In the name of joking. I'm not saying a lot of these blue jokes aren't funny, but when you have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost would discipline you to say, you know what? I'm not going to give the devil credit for causing me to laugh even though in my flesh, in my flesh, this does tickle me. But because I know the game, 
because I know what Satan is trying to do. I won't laugh at drag. I won't laugh at these blue jokes because these jokes do not even give a permanent, they don't give, they don't produce joy anyway. They are self-defeating. Proverbs 14 and 12 through 13 says, there is a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of the myrrh is heaviness. Yes, after you go see them, after they make you laugh and have you in stitches, you leave the show going back to your same old miserable life, same old miserable world, same old miserable existence. When Jesus gives real joy, and Jesus changes the situation. See, God wants us laughing, but he wants the laughter to be directed by God. He wants our joy to glorify him. How many believe what I'm saying today? For he has something for us that will make us more attractive to the world. Psalms 26, 126, uh -huh, records something that I want to leave you with today. It says, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. That is, when the Lord delivered us from that Babylonian captivity, it was like a dream come true. He said, when God delivered us, then was our mouth filled with laughter. Oh, Lord, when God brought them out, they laughed at the glory of God laughed at how the Lord worked it out and how the Lord set them free. And look at this, and our tongue with singing. He put a song on their tongue. He put laughter, hallelujah, in their mouths. Then said they among the heathen, they let the world know the Lord have done great things for them. I pray that you let the world know that God's done great things for you. I pray that when you talk to sinners, you don't complain about being hurt in the church. I pray that when sinners ask you what's going on, you don't just say to them, another day, another dollar. I pray that when sinners ask you how you doing, you don't say I'm all right, but you let them know that the Lord have done great things in your life. Do I have a witness in here who can say that in my life he's done great things? Good God Almighty. Notice what he says. He said the Lord have done great things for them. Then he goes back in verse 3 and said the Lord have done great things for us. It seemed like he doubled down on the theme of great things. And then it says whereof we are glad. I want to know is there anybody glad here? Glad over the great things. The gladness ought to show when you're singing. The gladness ought to show when you're serving. The gladness ought to come out in your walk. The gladness ought to come out in your talk. Has he ever healed you? Is that not a great thing? Did he save you? Is that not a great thing? When you were going down for the count and the Lord brought you out, I want to know something. Was that not a great thing? When he took care of your children just the other day, a ch the bus, a bus, a, a bus ran into a dump truck with children going, uh, coming from a field trip, and uh, lives were lost. And I thought of my oldest grandson, who had just the day before went on a field trip, and how God brought him home safely. I prayed for the family that suffered a loss, but my hands went up and joy and laughter came out of my mouth when I thought about how it could have been my grandson, but God spared his life. I call that a great thing. Do I have anybody here who have things in their lives that they can call great things? 
Will you take a praise break and give him glory for the great things that he's done in you? Let your praise go up. Let your joy be displayed. Yeah! Yeah! Yeah, Lord! Standing here is a great thing. Being able to have health and strength is a great thing. To have your mama home from the hospital is a great thing. To live 99 years, ah, that is a great thing. Yeah! Yeah! My, 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 my. Matter of fact, matter of fact, matter of fact, I, wanna, I just wanna take a minute here and do a comparison. I wanna do a comparison. I want you to compare some things that have happened in your life that you don't like and compare that to the things that God has done that you do like. The thing that Satan did to try to bring you down versus the thing that the Lord has done to hold you up. I want to see which thought is going to win out. The negative or the great thing. The, 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 the attack of the enemy or the great thing. He's done great things. Great things. Great things. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. You know, I love this psalm. He says he's done great things for us. Where are we glad? Now I could take Psalms 129 and, and preach this subject. If you praise him for what he's already done, then you can ask him to do something else because this psalm is broken up into at least two two hallelujah sections uh, maybe three because from verse one to verse three he was talking about how god brought him out from babylonian captivity but in verse four he says turn again our captivity oh lord he says turn again in other words you brought us out from there and we thank you for that but lord there is something else that we need you to do is there anybody here who has a something else that you want god to do is there something else that you want him to turn is there something else that you want him to fix if you have or something else then praise him for what he's already done before you bring up the something else praise him praise him Somebody's catching on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn, O oh Lord. O oh Lord. As the streams of the south. What is the point? He said, God, when you brought us out of the captivity of the Babylonians, that was wonderful. It was a dream come true. It was a great thing. But when we got back home, the land was dry. The 
the grounds were parched. The land was, the desert was hard. And we thank you for what you've done. But we need you to move again. We need you. I'm no longer in Babylonian captivity. The prisoner may say, I've done my time. I've been set free. I walked out the jail. But Lord, now I need a job. I thank you for bringing me out of there. But Lord, you ought to throw your hands up. But Lord, but Lord, I think it's called Negev. In that area, the land was dry, except for a short period during the winter season. And it wouldn't take much rain, just enough. If you sin just a little bit, that rain would be like a gully washer. And they said, Lord, it's not that. I'm not thankful for what you've done already, but I need you to do this. And while waiting on the Lord to send the rain, they didn't get mad. See, you got to know how to wait on him. You got to know how to act when you're waiting on him. You'll never get your blessing waiting on him. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help. I ain't meet with nobody to discuss it further. But you'll never get your blessing waiting on him with a long face. You'll never get your blessing waiting on him with your lips poked out. You'll never get your blessing waiting on him feeling sorry for yourself. Here's what you do. You, you act. You act in faith when you're waiting on him. You begin to behave just like it's already done. When you're waiting on him, you begin to make a move like God is making his move. Why do you see it in the text? He said, send the rain in the south while we're waiting for rain. Let's go out and let's sow in tears. It's hard, it's dry, but I'm sowing anyhow because I know that if I sow in tears I'm going to reap in joy I know that if I sow the Lord somebody praise him right now they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Joy is on the way. Yeah! Yeah! Uh, Woo! Waiting on the law. Waiting on the law. Going forth. Barry. Precious seed, waiting on the law, bearing precious seed. But if you go forth, bearing precious seed, waiting on the law, Bible said, doubtless they will come again, rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. You ought to grab somebody by the hand and tell them. I may be weeping while I'm sowing, but watch me in a few days. Ah, I'm going to come again rejoicing. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Thank you. I need 
a few more to come on down here and act like, like you believe that God is doing it for you.